We have already done inference for simple regression using a t-test, and now we're going to look at doing another sort of form of inference for regression using ANOVA, or analysis of variance. And we'll find that we get the exact same results when we do a two-tailed test, when we do this approach, but this will be a nice lead-in to chapter 13 material when we have more than one predictor. So this is section 12.4. Um, looking at an analysis of variance or ANOVA table. So ANOVA, this is analysis of variance. And we already started looking at uh, the different sources of variability when we were looking at R squared. We looked at sum of squares total and that that was actually uh, the sum of squares regression or the model and sum of squares error. And we're gonna look at those two components as well now in this analysis of variance table. So we've got source, and this is the source of variability in the response. There's total variability, and this is total variability in the response. And that can be broken up into two components. We've got the regression component and the residual component. And we can also see this as model and error, and that's actually what it's going to look like when we look at jump or usually some other software packages. Now, this first line, uh, the first row, is regression. And what this is really saying is how much uh, is the error reduced by using the model instead of y bar to predict y. And that's familiar, because that's what we talked about when we were looking at r squared. The residuals is saying how much error remains when we use the model instead of y bar to predict y. So we can think of this regression as explained error or explained variability and residual as what is left over or how much error is unexplained variability. And we're going to look at each of these rows in turn. So we'll start off with this explained or regression variability. We've got the degrees of freedom, and the degrees of freedom for the regression, that's just gonna be the number of slopes in the model. And for simple regression, there's only one slope, so the degrees of freedom for regression is one. The sums of squares to the model, this should be familiar, because this is the same as what we saw when we saw R squared. So we can see that we've got predictions using the regression equation, and prediction used predictions using y bar, and we just want to know how different are they. And we hope that if we have a very steep slope, that these predictions are going to be very different, especially at the extreme ends of our uh, x range. So when we have a steep slope, our predictions should be very different. And if we don't have a very steep slope, then these two values, are these, these two values y hat and y bar, will be very similar. So that's just our sum of squares. We can see that we are literally adding up squared differences. And then finally, we have our mean squares, which is gonna be denoted MS. And so for our MS regression, or our MS model, we have our sum of squares, so that's just a, a summation, divided by pieces of information, which in this case is one, our degrees of freedom for regression, because there's only one piece of information, there's just one slope. And so this is literally our average sum of our average uh, squared regression. So on average, this tells us how different our lines are from each other in squared terms. So this is just a sum over pieces of info. We can think of mean squares generally as sums of squares divided by degrees of freedom within a row. Now, to do our next row down, 
we look at our unexplained variability. And again, that is our residuals. So our residuals are the differences between our observations and the line. And we're gonna see that when we look at our sum of squares residuals. Now we saw already that when we did a one sample t-test for the slope, we used degrees of freedom n minus two. And we said that that was generally n minus the number of parameters in our simple regression equation. So for a t procedure, that's what we would use, and that comes from this residual error. For our sum of squares, we have our sum of squared residuals, or our sum of squared errors, and this is how different our observations are against our regression line. So we have our observations, and we have our prediction equation, and we want to know how different they are. We like our residuals to be small, so we hope that this difference for each of our observations is small. And we're going to square all those different differences and add them all up. And we saw that when we were looking at r squared. And just when we saw mean squared before for regression, our mean squared error is going to be the sum of our squared residuals divided by our degrees of freedom. So again, that's SSE, our sum of squared errors around the line, divided by the degrees of freedom for error. So this is again another sum. So we might call this our mean squared error, or MSE. This MSE, this is our estimate of sigma squared, which is the variance around the line. We haven't talked about MSE before, but we have talked about RMSE. This MSE is RMSE squared. So remember, RMSE is the root mean squared error. So if we were to square a root mean squared error, we would end up with a squared term. So if we wanted to find our RMSE, RMSE is MSE square rooted. Finally, the last thing that we have, the last row in our analysis of variance table, is the total row. And again, this is the total variability in our response. This is what's looking at, this is looking at the difference between our observations versus the grand mean. And we saw this again when we were looking at r squared. So we would be looking at our observations around just a flat line. So how different are our observations from this flat line. We don't deal with this when we're doing our analysis because we know that SS total can be broken up into SS reg plus SSE. So SS total is our starting point and we break it out into these two components, SSE and SS reg. So all of this is well and good, but we still haven't actually gotten to a point where we might find a test statistic or do any actual inference. So these are the components, these are the pieces that we work up to, and we actually end up using the mean squares to find our test statistic. The F test, or the ANOVA F statistic, is an alternative test for testing the null hypothesis against what always must be a two-tailed test. ANOVA is always two-tailed. So we do lose a little bit of freedom when we do an F-test as opposed to a T-test. The T-test, for example, we could do beta less than zero or beta greater than zero for our alternative hypothesis. For an F-test, it is always a two-tailed alternative. The F-test statistic is our mean squared for regression versus our mean squared error which would be MSR over MSE. What this is really looking at is our explained variability, that is, how much error has reduced by using the model, over our unexplained variability, how much error is left over when we use our model. When we have strong evidence against the null that there is no linear association, will f be large or small? Well, if we have strong evidence, we should have a lot of explained variability 
and relatively little unexplained variability. Our residuals should be small. That means our unexplained variability should be small. And ideally, our slope should be steep. That would be a large effect. That would mean that our explained variability is large. And altogether, that means f is going to be much, much bigger than 1. So let's look at our car weight and mileage data. And in this case, we had a sample of 25 cars and we measured their weights and mileage, my, their weights and mileages in miles per gallon. <coughs> in this case, we can see that there is one slope because there was only uh, one predictor. So we only looked at one simple regression model. Degrees of freedom for error, this is n minus two. And our degrees of freedom for total is consistent with what we had before, which would be n minus one. We can see that our sum of squares for model, sum of squares for regression, added together, our sum of squares for model and error, total our sum of squares total. And we can also see that if we were to do sum of squares reg divided by one, we get our mean squares for regression. Similarly, we see that sum of squares error divided by degrees of freedom for error, that gives us mean squares for error. This F ratio, this is our F statistic, which I call F obs. This is found by taking 630.925 and dividing by our MSE 9.097. Our F statistic is always going to be our model divided by our error. And we know, of course, always to ignore the stars and color coding in our p-values. So what does this F distribution look like? It's unlike any distribution we've talked about so far in this class in that it is very heavily right skewed. <coughs> and when we have one degree of freedom, the mean is going to be about one. So when the null is true, that is, when there is no linear association, that distribution is going to look like this. And so all the unusual values are going to be out here in the right tail. So even though we're doing a two-tailed test, that is, beta is not equal to zero, we're going to look for a p-value greater than our f obs. So, how do we interpret this? If there is no linear association, between car weights and mileage, the probability of obtaining an F statistic at least this large is less than 0 0.0001. So this is my interpretation of the p-value. This is very unusual if the null is true. What does my F statistic mean? We have observed 69 times more explained variability than unexplained variability. in this sample.
that's a lot. So for our conclusion, with both of these things in mind, there is strong evidence of a linear association. between car weight and mileage. Given the large effect, in this case our F statistic, and very small p-value. These data are compatible with a linear relationship.